So John, I'm going to turn to you. Tell me a little bit about um, trying to risk uh, stratify patients. Uh, there is a variety of different um, uh, prognostic indexes: the FLIPI, the FLIPI two, the you know the M seven. Do you, do you they work? But do you use these on a regular basis on patients? You know, or is this only for clinical trials? You know, how do you um, risk stratify your patients? Sure. So. Uh, the IPI, or International Prognostic Index, has been around for over 25 years. Age, performance status, LDH, external disease, uh, and stage of disease. That then evolved into the follicular lymphoma IPI, which uh, has some similarities, some overlap, including LDH as an example, age, um, but takes into account uh, hemoglobin and number of sites of disease. That's then uh, evolved into the FLIPI-2, which also includes beta-2 microglobulin. Uh, and then the M7 FLIPI, or the molecular version or modified version of the FLIPI, um, looks at a couple of different um, mutations that can be seen in follicular lymphoma and correlates that with outcomes. So for instance, EZH2, which we'll come back to later, a mutation that's occasionally seen in follicular lymphoma, is associated with a better prognosis in general with, with follicular lymphoma. So, so the, the net of that is that um, we have these markers. Now, how we translate them into choosing therapy is not so clear. And you know, one could really uh, argue that um, we really shouldn't risk adapt at all on the basis of these because we have very little um, randomized data that says that a high-risk patient should be treated differently than a low-risk patient. That said, clearly a patient that has high-risk features, bulky disease, more symptoms, that may be a patient who needs more therapy, needs chemotherapy um, versus a low tumor burden. And we're going to get to the, the GELF criteria as an example and the tumor burden there. The higher tumor burden patients tend to have higher risk flippy scores and therefore more symptoms and therefore may need a chemoimmunotherapy approach versus something like an, an antibody alone approach with rituximab. So I think that's how it primarily um, influences things. Also, again, you worry a little bit more about transformation in higher risk patients. They're the ones that are going to have the high LDH. So those are people where you might be more prone to give our chop as an example. Um, even if you don't diagnose transformation, you at least may be more concerned about it and lean a little bit more in that direction in some cases. Great. Um, Pier Luigi, similar uh, approach in um, in Italy to what he's talking about. He's, uh, you know, do you do you use these prognostic indices for changing therapy or not? Do you um, or do you just find it helpful for giving sort of long term information? Uh, sure. No, I, I think we use in on the same on the same way. In particular, recently with the advent of the gallium study and so the advent of ibinutuzumab. Uh, in combination with conventional chemotherapy like uh, bendamastin or CHOP or CVP. Uh, in, in Europe, there was official indication concerning the possibility to use opinotuzum instead of rituximab, in particular in uh, intermediate high-risk patients according to the FLIPI score. So for this reason, this is uh, an example that we can uh, use this kind of uh, uh, prognostic score uh, in terms of differentiating the treatment uh, in, in, the, in the setting of follicular lymphoma. Okay. Laurie, one of the one things we haven't talked about is how you um, use comorbidities, age, other things to incorporate into your initial evaluation of patients and how that might change treatment. So, um, you know, this is, these are diseases of, of aging. Right? The, the incidence of follicular lymphoma is higher in patients that are, that are older and they're the patients that are going to have other, uh, other illnesses. So how does that factor in? I think it's very important in uh, to consider the whole patient's course in chronic illnesses such as follicular lymphoma and how potentially to sequence things, particularly in patients with comorbidities. So maybe an older patient, say 80s, 90s, who does meet GELF criteria and otherwise would start treatment, maybe that patient even you would watch and wait longer or do a, a, a less intensive therapy because their overall life expectancy independent of the follicular lymphoma is very different than when you're considering treatments for a patient who's in their 30s at diagnosis and has, um, you know, a more maybe rapidly progressive course, though maybe not technically meeting criteria to, to start treatment, that patient's journey is going to be dramatically different. So I think it's important to consider age, comorbidities, um, along with the available treatment options in this rapidly changing um, treatment environment um, in terms of the timing of when you start things and what you choose and what you plan to do next if, if that treatment fails. 
One, one thing that comes up more and more, which I'm curious what other people uh, on, in the group say, is the concern about bendamustine in older patients. And, and you know, I, I have to say I'm a little less concerned about that, but I hear people expressing a lot more concern. You know, if you have a patient in their late 70s or 80s, even not even giving a reduced dose of bendamustine, we're giving something like CVP instead if the patient needs chemotherapy. I'm curious what you all... I feel exactly. like it's been a while since I've given uh, CVP. <laughs> yeah, um, you, know, you know, I can understand. I, I haven't, I haven't experienced it. In general, I, I would dose reduce and use bendamustine if I needed a chemotherapy. Yeah, the same for me. I'm using no, I, th I think uh, when the abinutuzumab data came out from gallium, that's when we got the signal. Of course, there was bendamustine toxicity in both arms of gallium, but I'm increasingly hear people say that they would consider using CVP with abinutuzumab. Um, and then once you've started thinking about using CVP again, as, as Laurie already said, people are then maybe escalating down. I, I'm with you. I'm finding bendamustine pretty well tolerated in these patients. And it certainly hasn't been my experience to see some of the toxicities that were seen in the gallium data. But I'm, I'm hearing people that hadn't used CVP up for a long time going back to using it on the basis of what came out from gallium. And on the other end, I have concern, um, I think, long before starting bendamustine in a very young patient. Um, not necessarily because I think they won't tolerate it or have higher you know, infectious risk, but the prolonged lymphopenia, particularly com if you're considering abinutuzumab combined neutropenia, and then moving forward, maybe that patient eventually needs a cellular therapy and the long-term effect on, on bone marrow bendamustine, I think we don't know as much about in the young follicular lymphoma patient. 